I'm assuming you're doing well this morning, relatively so. And that's a broad, broad uh, concept. Uh, well, what is wellness? Um, but uh, here, you're, you're here. And that's indicative of, of God's favor upon you. And I, I thank the Lord that um, you uh, decided to spend some time with other saints in this place. Thank you for your faithfulness and coming this morning. And I too want to thank the Lord for um, a couple of saints that communicated with me this week. Um, Sister Washington, uh, Steve's wife, I don't know if you're here, but I, I so appreciate your communication with me this week. She sent me a, a, um, an email and being very helpful with uh, helping me with my corrupt roots uh, that uh, we were talking about last week. In fact, uh, her email showed me a couple of places where I could go and the proper way for dealing with roots that are taking over your lawn. I, I appreciate that, I really do. And uh, one of the, um, a couple of the sites, in fact, they, they were very instructful and very helpful Instructive, yeah, instructive and very helpful in the sense that <clears throat> they thought, they thought I want to preserve the life of the tree. They assume that I want to protect the life of the tree. So the article was saying, be careful in cutting roots because you might affect the life of the tree. Well, <clears throat> I'm not so interested in the life of the tree. I just am not. In fact, what I failed to share with you all last week is that those trees were planted by Anne Arundel County. It's, it's, on their, it's in their, their easement. Um, you know, you have, you have the street, you have the, the, uh, the little easement there from the street, and, and the trees are planted there, and then you have the walkway. In fact, I, I took some pictures and I was going to show it, but time got away from me. Um, but but you got to see this. Um, so you've got the, the street, the easement where the trees are growing, and I've got pavement. And then my, um, our, Tracy and our, our house, our yard, what's left of it. Thank you, Roots. Um, what's left of it. And the trees, I called Anne Arundel County because the tree roots were pushing up the cement slab. Amen. And I called and they sent out some, I guess every bit, three trucks and had to be about eight men. And they took up the cement slab, the broken slab, and they relayed new cement slab. And when they were done, I said to them, what are you going to do about the root? They said, well, that's not our job. <laughs> I don't know, folks. Maybe it's me. <laughs> but if you call the county and you're complaining about the roots, you expect that they will come out and take care of the roots. Not the case. So I guess it was about a year later, and here we are now. And those roots are pushing up the cement slab all over again. I called, and this time they sent out three trucks, about eight men. And this time, rather than replace the whole cement slab, they just patched it with black tar. They were concerned about a tripping hazard. They don't want people to trip over the cement slab that's raised up from the ground. So we'll just put black tar over there and fill in the... And in the meantime, the roots are still pushing, pushing it up. It, it's crazy stuff. And so going into my yard and, and I took a picture of these roots they start in the easement, 
and they're going all the way across our property into our neighbor's property. And, and, and the, the shoots of the trees are poking up in the lawn. Found out that tree roots suck the life, the nutrients out of the soil and kill the grass. It, the, it's like the tree roots want nothing else growing there. So all I've got, I, I've got, I, I mean, my grass, what little is left, it's in, like in patches, a little patch here, a little patch there, and all because of these, these uncontrolled roots. Well, I found another site, and this site said, if you want to get rid of roots, you gotta, what, what you got to do is one of two things. You got to poison the tree. Amen. Or you got to go through literally digging up the roots. And eventually that might lead to the tree's demise. I'm not intentionally trying to kill the tree. But I am trying to preserve my yard. And what is inescapable is the, the, uh, the parallel between what roots do to a yard, as I shared last week, and what our corrupt nature, fallen nature, does to our soul. Um, just like the, the ground, the roots do not allow other things to thrive in that area. It creates a desolate, dry soil until finally all that's left is, are the roots, dry dirt, and rocks. True, tree roots are, are just so indicative of what can go on in our spirits, in our hearts, if left unattended. Took a picture of all the tools I used. I was going to show you all the tools. The shovel, the pickaxe, I told you about it last week, the reciprocating saw. And I, I was just amazed. Sheila knew what a reciprocating saw was. I mean, that's, that's amazing. And then there, there is the, also the, uh, I, I did say the shovel, right? Those, those, those pieces of equipment that that you need in order to dig up roots. Amen. It takes work to break up the ground with that pickaxe. You take the pickaxe, in, ca in case you don't know how a pickaxe, <laughs> what to do, you, you, you have to chop. chop it. And you gotta, you gotta be deliberate and forceful can't play with it. And you got to take the shovel and dig it up over and over. And it takes, it takes, it's going to take, took me every bit two hours to finally get to the root and its length. And then there are all these other smaller roots that are coming off of it. It's, it's just a, a hideous work. It's, a, it's, it's just an assignment, a, uh, an effort that, that is so requires diligence. It just does. But I'm determined. I'm determined. The, the roots are persistent, and I'm determined that I'm going to get rid of the roots. Because I want to spare, I want to spare what's left of the yard. I want to see grass growing. I want to see the lush beauty of green grass returning to, to my yard. Peter says, Amen. that we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature as you're escaping the corruption that is in the world through lust. The same can be said for corruption that's in us in terms of what it requires 
to develop, as Peter says, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue. How do you do this? How do you add virtue to your faith in old, crusty, rock-filled, hard-hearted soil? How do you do that? I, I like what, uh, I'm going to ask you to turn there. In fact, look with me at uh, Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah. I think Jeremiah has the secret for us. Some of you are perhaps uh, wondering, and as I, I'm wondering, I want to let you know the same, that I, I'm wondering. I, I had no plans of spending. In fact, you know what? We've been talking about the virtue of God, the being partakers of the divine nature. We've been talking about God's virtues since March of this month. Did you know that? Did you know that? And here we are today. Oh, what's up, Pastor Gaines? Don't you have anything else to preach about? Doesn't the Bible talk about anything else? It's curious, what is it? What is it that, that brings us back? And I would suggest to you that it takes this kind of deliberate effort on our part, exposing our hearts to the teaching of the Word of God. And, and that, and that if, if I stand here and give and preach a sermon, teach a lesson, that does not ensure that does not ensure that you heard it clearly, that you understood it as you should. It does not ensure that you know how to actually put it into, into practice. What does it take? It takes, it takes time. It takes time to grow lush grass. It takes time to develop a fertile soil so virtue can grow. In the meantime, Jeremiah says this. Listen to this. The Lord said to me, I'm in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, Jeremiah, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of their faces. Amen. I want you to know. It can be intimidating standing before the people of God, standing before anybody and saying, thus says the Lord. And Jeremiah is, is exhorted, encouraged by God to not be afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand, touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. Now, clearly, he, he, you know, God hasn't given me the, 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 uh, the, the venue for speaking to the nations. But he certainly did do that for Jeremiah. Gave him the venue, the, the uh, uh, as it were, the pulpit, not, not physical, but the the ability, the, the opportunity to proclaim to the nations, both Israel and other foreign nations and kingdoms. God set him up to speak on, on his behalf. And he set him up to speak on his behalf to do this. See, I have set you this day to set you over the nations, over the kingdoms to do this. What? To root out and to pull down. To destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Before, before virtue can grow in any soil, you've got to root up. You've got to break up the fallow ground, the hard, stony, dry soil that's in our spirits. And, and you, need, you need to recognize the reality of what the human heart is and what it's like. Jeremiah goes on to say that it is desperately wicked. Amen. In and of ourselves, there is this sense of, of, of just horror, horrible, the horrible condition of 
fallenness. And, and Peter, Peter says, add to your faith as you're, as you're escaping corruption. Fill, fill that soil in. Now backfill that soil with what? Virtue. Yes, sir. Because if you don't backfill what you, you're escaping, that corruption is going to continue to spread. Come on. But before you even begin the, the work of adding virtue, let's break that soil up. Yes, sir. Get your pickaxe, get your saw, get your shovel. It takes time. It takes time. It takes deliberate effort. And, and I would say to you, I would say to you, nobody, nobody is going to become like Jesus by accident. Driving, I was driving down the street, and I guess I just got lucky. I decided, wow, look, I'm like Jesus. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by, circ it's not because you're lucky. We're, we're, we don't deal in, in luck. We deal in providence. The power of God working through us. And so as we grow, as we grow, it's because we're being deliberate about that growth. Amen. We're, we're, we're being intentional about it. Come on, man. And, and so the, the idea of, of adding virtue requires this kind of deliberate, concerted effort to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down. And, and you know, when you look at that passage there in Jeremiah, that, that is pretty, I mean, he is pretty absolute. He, it's like he doesn't want anything remaining of what was to prepare the ground, as it were, for what should be. And conceptually, that's, that's how we need to approach growth in Jesus Christ. That when Peter says, add to your faith, he's not saying add this with what you got. Add this with the corruption. But it's add in replace of. You're es we're escaping corruption, Peter says. Now be diligent to add yes, sir. in place of. In fact, here in um, 2 Peter um, 5, um, he says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, yes, sir. add to your faith. This word, this word, uh, diligence, Adding diligence, adding to your faith, giving all diligence. That word, you don't need to know the Greek word that Peter um, used, but I want you to know it's the same word that Luke used in Luke 19. Go with me there to Luke. And what are we talking about? We're talking about adding to our faith virtue. And I just want you to see what it looks like. What does diligence look like? I mean, if you, have, if you, if you, if you need a visual, Luke provides for us a visual for what diligence looks like. Diligence looks like this in Luke 19. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Yes, he did. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, oh, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Yes, and he sought to see who Jesus was, oh, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Yes, he was. So he ran ahead climbed up into a sycamore tree. I wonder if it had roots. He climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, to see Jesus, 
for he was going to pass that way. Now, now he has already demonstrated diligence. Would you say? Would you say? He ran to get ahead of the crowd just to get a look, just to take a look at Jesus. Who is he? So he ran ahead and climbed into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place where Zacchaeus was up in a tree, now metaphorically, all of us were up in a tree one day. <laughs> you know? But here, Zacchaeus was up in a tree. Jesus looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down, for today I must stay at your house. The word there, make haste, is the same word Peter used. Giving all diligence. So the, 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 the issue of giving diligence has a time factor. In Luke, the time factor is expressed. What? Make haste. What? Hurry up and do this. Look at verse 6. So he made haste. See, that's, that's a time factor. That re reflects on, on the issue. I tell you what he didn't do. He didn't say, give me a minute, Jesus. I'll be, I'll be right with you. He didn't say, well, Jesus, uh, you, you know what? I, 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 I've got I've to go to work, um, you know? And no. Now, here is a rich man. And he set aside everything so that he could what? Make haste. So there's a time element. There's a time element involved. I would suggest even in Peter's word, when he says giving all diligence, he's not talking about doing this tomorrow. This is to be, to be diligent is to do it now, to do it today. Because if, if it's worthy of diligence, it's diligence now. If it's delayed, you're not being diligent. If you're putting it off, you're procrastinating. Giving all diligence. It's like, do it and do it now. That's, that's Peter's. That's the tone of Peter's word when he, when he says giving all diligence. Add to your faith. I'm, I'm reading here in um, um, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And, and I love their... Um, rendition or their translation because it just just a slight nuance difference in terms of the language the use of the language there here in verse 5 the Holman says for this very reason make every effort to supplement your faith in verse 10 he says Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. And this is the Holman Christian. And then he uses the word again in verse 15. And Peter says of himself, I will also make every effort that you may be able to recall these things at any time after my departure. In Peter's mind, here he's getting ready to die. He's in prison, getting ready to die, and he's not postponing this, this issue, this information they need, and they need it now. He says, I'm, I'm making every effort to make sure and to remind you of these things before I die. He did not postpone it. It's like, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it now. And he says, make every effort, every effort, every effort. To supplement your faith. <laughs> Told you about all the supplements I'm taking. Up, up to 20. Um, and and I, I tell you, I don't know, for those of you who take medication, you just grow tired. Yes, sir. 20, 20 pills. Amen. Supplements. But, but you, know, you, you know what? See, 
the 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 uh, ortho uh, I forgot the natural path. She she um, told us told Tracy and I that this is going to supplement. This is going to help your immune system because your body, as you grow older, your body is not producing the level of nutrients that your body needs to to sustain the the effectiveness of your immune system because the food we eat some it's it's a lot of it's deprived of the the levels of nutrients that we need frozen foods don't not to even mention fast food has no virtually no nutrients that are going to help your immune so you need what supplementation you need something along with what you're eating Peter says you need, you need to supplement your faith. I know you got faith, but now you need to add something to help the immune, the immune process of keeping what? That, that corruption away. Jesus. Strengthen your, your spiritual immune system by what? By, by adding to your faith. And you can, you can be sloppy about this thing and lazy about this thing if you want. But you know what? I, I realize this, that, you, you know, if God, if God wants to heal me, you know, I can sit there and sit on my sofa and say, you know what, God, I'm waiting for you to heal me. I don't need, the, I don't need those supplements. Heal me, Jesus. Dave, take the supplements. What God wants to what? Use the supplements to heal me. Why, why, why should I just wait? Wait for some, some supernatural move. Now, he can do what he wants. I know that. But he gave me wisdom enough to know that I need to take care of this vessel, this body. Now, cause I could see if I, if I didn't have um, the, the ability, if I didn't have all, all that I need, if I didn't have access to it. But when we have access, when we have the knowledge, when we have the ability, why sit around and wait for a supernatural move of God? No, we, we need to take every, make every effort. And by the way, by the way, do it the same time every morning. Be consistent. Amen. Be consistent. You, I mean, if, you, if you're going to supplement your faith, you've got you to be consistent with this thing. Yes, you do. Okay. Take it today, skip tomorrow. Uh -huh. Take part of it today, no. use this in, in place of it. I, it, it. It just takes diligence, it takes consistency to really add to our faith. This, this idea, this idea of adding to our faith in Peter's thinking is, is a time factor. Time is wrapped up in this. Yes, sir. And for this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith. The work of grace requires our complete, total participation with the Holy Spirit in developing virtue as a partaker of his divine nature. He's not going to do it without you. It's just not going to happen. And so if you don't pray, it ain't happening. If you're not ex accessing, if you're not accessing supplement, if you're not accessing the, the teaching of the word of God, it's not going to happen. And, and let, can, I, can I say this? You and I are not going to develop virtue on Sunday morning. Sister Mary, what would you say? It takes more, more than what we're doing here on Sunday. See, see some of us, some of us are, are, are robbing ourselves of the supplementation that we need. The supplementation that we need is in the corporate body. You, you and I need this in order to add virtue to our faith. And how, what, where would I get that concept? Because Peter, Peter writes this singular letter to a group of people who don't have the Bible for themselves. The only way they're going to know what Peter said is that when they gather in a group and the reader reads the letter and explains the letter to the people gathered. 
the, the reader, the, the pastor would copy the letter and send it to the next house or the next pastor. They would gather. They would read. It's, it's intended. It's embedded in the text. What? Corporate life. Life together in Jesus Christ. And, and so what I'm, I'm afraid what we've done in, in, in um, modern Christianity, we've, we've flipped the idea of, of, uh, of uh, spiritual formation and discipleship. And now we're making it something about a, 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 personal, a personal approach. I can do this on my own at home. And, and that's fine. I mean, we, 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 we ought to be reading and praying at home. But I'm just telling you in the text. In the text, the expectation is, is that the people of God will pursue the teaching of the word of God collectively. Amen. Look, go with me. See, I, I don't know that you are hearing me. I, I don't know that you're, you're really uh, accepting that. Um, but look with me at Ephesians. Look with me at Ephesians 4. And, and the point being, when, when Peter says giving all diligence um, add to your faith, he's not talking about an individual. He's not talking to an individual. He's talking to a collective body of believers. So it's a communal, it's a communal effort. And in the communal effort, there is this, this responsibility of being accountable to one another. This week, we spent a, a week in prayer. And I thank God. I thank God for those precious saints that, that came out this week. Some came out every night, every night. And I know they were tired. I know they were physically tired. But they deliberately made, made every effort to diligently pursue prayer, corporate prayer. And, and, and why? Because that's what the scripture, it's embedded in the scripture that we, we that God, God uses these graces in a corporate, at a corporate level to strengthen us and develop us. Look at Ephesians. Look at Ephesians chapter four. Hey, are you there in Ephesians? Yes. And he personally, Jesus, gave some to be apostles. He gave some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers. That's, that's essentially the New Testament church. That, that uh, the New Testament church now is essentially being led by pastor teachers. There aren't any more apostles. I said there aren't any more apostles. And, and you know, I mean, it's, if they personally want to call themselves, that, that's fine. But as far as heaven is concerned, there are only 12. And their names are going to be in, on, on, on the, uh, the, uh, the gates of the New Jerusalem. So there are 12 apostles, and, and in terms of prophets, prophets, God, God um, in, indeed, this, this prophetic, this prophetic office has been, has been enmeshed and, and immersed into the pastoral office, that of proclaiming what God is going to do. Pastors also proclaim what God has said. So it's this pastoral role of, of teaching. Look at this, pastor, teacher. And what are pastor teachers for? To train the saints. You can't train yourself. Now, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to help you here. That the, the onus and the responsibility for diligently pursuing the graces that will alter and transform and develop us spiritually Forming us into the image of Jesus Christ will happen in, in, in corporate life, primarily. Teach and train the saints so that they can do the work of the ministry. Amen. In doing so, they will build up the body of Christ. Yes, sir. At our, our leadership meeting yesterday, the, we asked the question, are we a healthy church? using these metrics in, in this section of scripture, we concluded, we concluded that manna is not spiritually healthy. And, and like every doctor and like every patient, patients don't want to hear that. I didn't go, I didn't go to Dr. T to hear her say, you've got cancer. But I went to her to assess my condition tell me what's going on in my body. And no, I was not, was not when, when Dr. David Goldstein first uh, came up with it. He said, you've got cancer. I didn't go to him for that. I just went for a regular routine checkup. Hey, doc, what you doing? 
What's happened? Well, Dave, you've got cancer. I didn't go for that. But, and, and the news, the news was startling. And, and beloved, beloved, as, as God examines us and evaluates us, we, we, we need to understand that we're not healthy. How do, we, how do we know that we're not healthy? The text says, until we all come into the unity of the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing into mature men and women. How? Measured by the statue of Jesus Christ. So it's like, it's, it's measuring ourselves by Jesus. So that we're no longer children tossed about with waves, with the waves and blown around every wind of teaching. See, I, I, I know we're not spiritually uh, uh, healthy because we, we don't like sitting down and, and being taught the word of God. Generally speaking, most of us, and I say most of us because it's the minority, it's the minority who are accessing the, 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 the blessed graces of, of, of nurturing and, and spiritual formation. But, but, but the larger body of manna, they're, they're just not after that. Now, I know this is not what you want. You didn't come to hear that today. But you need to hear it. You need, you, need to hear, you need to hear the expectation of what God has for you spiritually. And, 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 and if you, you go on thinking that I'm okay, I'm okay. Meanwhile, those roots, those corrupt roots are still eating away at the lush soil of God's heritage. What he wants, what he wants is... is, is um, but, but believers to access what to to be diligent in our pursuit he, he goes on and how, how else do we we know we're, we're not we're not healthy but here in Ephesians he says look we're speaking the truth in love let us grow up in every way into him who is the head even Christ grow up spiritually grow up how, how do we know you, you know what you know what one in the one in the um, I think it was um, it was uh, Timothy Keller his book on prayer made a stunning uh, statement um, that, that we read this week about prayer and how essential it is. And, and the, the, the nature of corporate prayer, how essential it is. He said, it's desperate people who pray. People who are not desperate don't pray. And you might ask yourself, I think it begs the question, then why aren't people desperate? You know why we're not desperate? Because we have our lives filled with everything else. We don't need God. We got this, that, this and that. We've got our leisure. We've got our hobbies. We've got, uh, we, we've got Google. What? We, we, We've got it, all, and it just fills, fills the soil, the soil of God's lush heritage in our spirits. And my prayer, my prayer is God, make us desperate. Break up this, this cold-hearted heart, stony heart that keeps resisting what you want to do in our lives. Take away this and that move stuff around shuffle it around and make the people of God uneasy and do whatever it takes but bring us to our knees make us desperate for you how are you going to be how are we going to be desperate how are you doing today I'm good no we're not The Bible says here in Ephesians 4, from him, the whole body, this is Christ. Christ says that the text says him, the whole body of Christ is what fitted and knit together. He, by the spirit, put us in the body, put us where he wanted, gave us the gift. We we're part of his body, knit together by every supporting ligament, that every Part of the body promotes the health and the growth of the body itself by doing its part. How do I know we're not healthy? Because saints aren't 
doing their part. If it weren't for the minority, man praying on our knees, if it weren't for the minority gathering together in prayer, I'm not so sure that man would even be here. I suspect that we'd have to close the doors if we had to depend on, on saints who are not doing their part. It's the few who are, who, are, who are bearing the load of the many. Peter says, give it all diligence. Don't let anything get in your way in developing virtue. I put together this, uh, this list. You, you have that, right? Put together this list, and all I did, all I did in, in, in Scripture, all I did is went to Scripture, went to passages. I guess I should have put the passages there. But I went to the passages of Scripture because what I was looking for was when, when Peter says, Add to your faith virtue. What is he talking about? He's talking about moral excellence. Well, what is moral excellence? Virtue generally means it's the highest standard of moral excellence, which excellence, which is ultimately an expression of God's divine nature. It's who God, God is morally excellent. And Peter says that you and I are partakers of his divine nature. And to the degree, to the degree that we're breaking up those roots is, is to the degree that we're able to extract those roots out of the soil. That's the degree to which we're becoming virtuous. But you can't get virtuous when you when you got when you hooked up and rooted up and with all this other stuff. So I, I went through scripture and just looking for virtue, moral excellence, and, and you, you've got the list here. But ponder with me, ponder with me. Um, humility and meekness. Now th this this is this is the divine nature. God's, God's nature. What? God is a humble God. Did you know that? God, God came down. The, the, the sending of his son, when his son, when God the son came down, that's humility. That God even speaks to sinners is humility. That he, even, that he even cares is humility. Amen. A holy God has every right to just wipe us out. Yeah. But God humbly yeah. is patient with sinners. Yeah. That's why you and I aren't in hell. Because he was patient with us. He humbled himself. Holiness demanded. Justice demanded payment. Mercy said, whoa, grace said, I'll fix it. Yeah. Humility and meekness, that's on the divine side. But on the human side, what, what, what is it our roots are producing? Arrogance and pride. Aggressiveness, haughtiness, self-sufficiency. You know what? You know what offends God more than anything? Pride and self, so I don't need God. And you know what? You know what? You may never have actually said the word, but your actions speak louder than your words. That the sense, the sense that you are prayerless says, I don't need God. I'm sufficient in myself. I, I, I'll be fine with what I have. It's dependent upon, your, your sense of, of well-being is dependent upon who you are and what you have. That's arrogance and pride. On, 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 the, on the divine side, it's grace. On our side, when God is being gracious to us, we are mean, harsh, callous. 
Oh, come on, folks. You know it. Let, let somebody cross you. Let somebody say or look at you the wrong way. Catch you at the wrong time. God is holy. We tend to be in our, in our fallenness, unholy and profane, immoral and ungodly. Righteous. God is righteous. We, we're, we are, that is, he is moral and just and decent and honest, but we are unrighteous. God is good. And we're evil. You may as well say we're, 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 a, we, we can, we're like a factory of evil and wicked, corrupt. The fallen nature can produce the stuff. The depravity that's within us. And, and the only way to root this stuff out, beloved, is to pursue virtue. Mm. The list goes on. I mean, kindness. You, you, I, I mean, look at it. Look at it. You're, you're, looking at, you're looking at me. Cruel. Spiteful at times. Coarse. Impolite. Rude. God is love. We, we tend to avoid or be, uh, you, you know, we repulsed by people. Yes. They don't look like we look. God is truthful. We're, we're, we tend to be deceitful and devious. You know, you can, you can be devious by, by uh, you, you know, you know, maybe you didn't tell a lie, but it, did you tell the truth? <laughs> That's the question. That's the question. And, and we can be deceitful with handling the truth. Yes. You know, we can piece it out, me, piecemeal it, but tell the whole truth. Yes. See, God, God, God the, the Bible says there's, there's no shadow of turning with him. God is joyful. And the fallen nature is miserable, gloomy, melancholic. God is hopeful. We're hopeless. Despondent, sad, just walking around full of, of just despair and despondency. God is forgiving. We're unforgiving, resentful, and vengeful. He's faithful. We're untrue, disloyal, untrustworthy. God is steadfast, unmovable. We're wavering, vacillating, indecisive. Were, were, you, were you, you going to church? You going to Bible study? I don't know. I'm... I'll, I'll see. It, it, it just, I, I don't know. It, it, it's just, it, I don't know. We're, we're full of it. We're just full of, of, of this vacillation relative to God up and down. And really, we, 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 we really decide whether or not we're going to do with God depending on our mood. What mood are you in? And sometimes it depends on, on whether, or not, whether or not we need him. And we use him. We try to use him like he's a bellboy. When, when things are going well, he doesn't even hear from us. But, but when things are going bad and sour, you get sick, you get cancer, you're calling on the name of... Well, where were you in times of joy? Amen. 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 We, we try to use God. Amen. How hideous is that? Try to manipulate God like he doesn't have enough sense to know. You're playing with me. You're, you're perpetrating. And yeah, he does know our hearts. Sad part is we don't. God is patient with, our, with us. We, we get touchy. Somebody bump into you. <laughs> I didn't mean, didn't mean any harm, but just bump into you. What, what's wrong with you? We were so easily provoked, sitting on the edge and, and just waiting, waiting for somebody to cross us. This stuff is in us. And, and you know what it is? You know what it is? It's looking for a place to happen. We, we, that, that sin nature is just, it's just looking for that opportunity to express itself. Yeah. You better get on top of those roots. Yeah. You, you better go pick, get, get that pickaxe and dig up that hideous root. Yeah. Or it's going to take over your lawn, the lush, 
provision of God's heritage in your life. God is long suffering. We're so easily annoyed and aggravated, vexed. What right do you and I have to be vexed by anything? Anything. When God has been so merciful and gracious to us. How dare you, how dare you get vexed by what somebody says to you. Take it and endure it for the glory of God. God is peaceful. <laughs> Think about this. Think about this. God is at peace with sinners. Yes, he is. He, he's waving the white flag. He's waving the white flag. I'm at peace. I mean you no harm. The cross says, I don't mean you any harm. You know what the cross says? The cross said God is trying to save us from God. He's trying to save us from God's wrath. Today he is peaceful. Today he is long-suffering. Today he will put up. He's tolerant and patient. But the day is coming. When he will judge in righteousness. God has such self-control. Such self-control. <laughs> you find this expressed in, in the Old Testament. Where the anger and the wrath of God. He allowed, he allowed Abraham to bargain with him. I'm, he told Abraham... I'm going to wipe them out. Amen. <laughs> and God, in, in, in his mercy and grace, he controlled himself. He allowed Abraham to mitigate, to mitigate his, his wrath and finally to get down to 10 people. He's, he's self-controlled. We're excessive and decadent and immoderate. We, we, just, we just let it all hang out. There are times where it just flows. What comes up comes out. And then we got, then we got the, the nerve to say, what? Well, I'm, I'm just speaking the truth in love. No, no, you're, you're trying to hurt. You're trying to hurt. Yeah. God is peaceful. And we're confrontational, petulant sulky, grumpy. I'm, I'm just talking about what's in, all right, maybe not you. Maybe not you. But I'm, I'm just talking about you, the, the kind of roots that, that I'm trying to dig up in, in the soil of my, my own spirit. Grumpy. And, 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 then, and then sometimes I find myself giving, giving off a little plastic smile. <laughs> For, forcing, forcing, forcing out a Oh, praise the Lord. And I praise the Lord. I don't even mean it. Are you serious? <laughs> Using the name of God in vain. What do you mean, praise the Lord? Through your grumpiness? <laughs> praise Him by being loving and gracious. God is full of wisdom. He's, he's the fountain of wisdom. And he wants to work all of these, all of these virtues. In, you, you know what, folks? God is wisdom, and we are so irrational, absurd, and we do senseless things, senseless, idiotic things. I look back on my life and wonder, what in the world was I thinking? Well, I was foolish. I'm looking at all this good night in the morning my dad would say all of this virtue and, and I'm humbled I'm humbled before him 
every day, every moment because, because of the, the, the deadly corrupt roots that, that permeate, that, that, that kind of ooze out unexpectedly. Could be reading the word of God and out of nowhere, out of nowhere, a corrupt, vile thought comes to mind. What is that? Just, just telling me that, you know what? I, I've got a lot of work to do, yes. and 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 I, I can't put this thing off. <laughs> I, I, God knows, I cannot put this thing off. I cannot because 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 if I put it off, the 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 roots are going to continue to spread, they're going to continue to spread, and they're going to pop up with these new sprouts. And I'm one. And guess what? Some I I've, I've got a little a little uh, a, a flower bed there, and even in the flower bed, the root the root from the tree is growing in the flower bed. I remember one day when I was watering watering it. It's a it's a corrupt root, but I'm feeding it with water. Because of my ignorance, didn't recognize. Man, that's a weed, that's a root. You don't water roots and weeds. You gotta dig that stuff up. But, but if we're not exposing ourselves to virtue, we, we, we don't understand what it looks like and we wind up spending time valuing roots and weeds. Oh, look at this precious little weed. The weed of our arrogance, the weed of self-sufficiency, the weed of our pride, our, our, the weed of cruelty and spitefulness. God, you know what? What a long journey we, we have. And, and when Peter says, give all diligence, I need you, Jesus. I, I can't do this. Can't do it by myself. 